After onsighting El Gran Bianco in the sector of Pilas Alcalinas, it was time to visit another sector, Cueva Negra, where there was a 9A to be tried, La Parra de los Monstruos, uh, which looked like it could be a good onsite candidate. Bueno, pues estamos en la Cueva Negra, en Montanejos, un lugar muy emblemático porque es un, bueno, está catalogado como zona de interés arqueológica. A parecer aquí vivió gente antaño y una de las curiosidades que tiene, además de toda la escalada, es que eh, las cavernas subterráneas de esta cueva comunican con otra cueva que hay en el barranco de la Maimona, que es donde escalamos el otro día. Y aquí, bueno, pues está concretamente la vía que va a escalar Adam, es la Parada de los Monstruos. Es una vía que está grabada de 9A, que abrieron Pedro y Nuria en el año 2002, si no recuerdo mal. Creo que tiene un par de ascensiones, no sé si le ha hecho alguien más, Ramón Julián y Alex Garriga. Y bueno, pues tiene fama de ser una vía icónica y de los pocos novenos que había en Montanejos hasta ahora, que hemos recibido la visita de Dani Andrada, que anda por ahí, y Jonathan Flor, y han equipado eh, por lo menos 10 vías, entre 8B y 9A más también. Estamos aquí, llevamos dos semanas y yo casi no me puedo ni concentrar en las vías porque estoy equipando, probando, haciendo las vías hasta 8C, que me gusta más porque puedo hacerla más rápido y a ver si consigo hacer la parada esta semana antes de irme, porque si no tendré que volver. Y seguro, más de nueva más, hay vías más duras para abrir. 9B o así, casi seguro. 9C no lo sé porque eso es un nivel que no lo llego ni a entender casi. Entonces no lo sé, pero seguro. Bueno, y el maquinista también está ahí que ya has probado y quizás sea 9B más, o sea que hay varias cosas, tienes que volver. When I was previewing the route, uh, the lower part was quite visible. The ground goes relatively parallel to the first part, so you feel kind of pretty close to the wall. So you can check out the holds quite well. So in the first 15 meters, I was more or less quite confident how I was going to climb it. Higher up, it was quite the opposite, but I was also hoping that maybe the second part of the route is maybe not the crux. And um, maybe around 15 meters, there was the section which was maybe less clear, and that was also what I expected to be the crux. I started climbing, I felt pretty good. The climbing was pretty much just as I expected. Uh, I definitely previewed some of the rests, uh, some of the rests in the knee bars. This was really good knee bar, uh, so I felt like I was making no mistakes leading up to this section, up to this rest, and the knee bar was even better than I expected. So that gave me quite a lot of confidence and motivation to keep going. So looking at it from the ground, I was a little bit worried about this section. It was obvious that there should be a right toe hook on this underclink, uh, which is not my favorite technique, but it worked out pretty well. I got to another kind of rest with this small knee bar. I clipped the next quick draw, but then I knew that this is gonna be a tricky section. There was a chalk to the left, there was a chalk to the right, I wasn't really sure where I should go. Um, at first I thought like I should go left, then right, and then I was kind of decided I should go left. I was really motivated, I think I was climbing really well all the way up to the crux and then I was a little bit hesitant, it's pretty obvious there are lots of different betas and in the meantime I just tried to rest and then I broke just a tiny piece of my knee bar. I could still hold on, holding onto one arm in this pocket, but as I was falling down my heel got into the rope and even though I'm pretty sure I would not have fallen if I was free soloing, the rope definitely helped me a bit. And in that case, I can't really call this as an ethical, so I just said take, worked out the moves in the next crux, and went down. 
So definitely a little bit of disappointment, but I think you need to stick to the ethical standards that uh, you have. And now it's gonna be the second try. I still haven't tried the second half of the route, so it's gonna be partly red point, partly on site. So exciting. So after one hour of rest, I was back on a wall, feeling definitely a bit less motivated than before my onside try, but still definitely wanting to get this route done. So in the end, for me personally, the easiest way to climb through this section was going all the way right, doing this kind of weird crossover move with kind of strange match next to my right hand, getting into this underclink and going left into yet another knee bar. I think this part is definitely the hardest for the onside try because there's just so many different options and it's really difficult to find the best one. On the other hand, if I didn't break this knee bar hold, I would definitely go to the left, which for me it felt definitely much harder uh, physically. But I think I would have a really good chance that I would not fall off, even if I went to the left. The real crux of the route is probably this section. Off this good knee bar you do a couple of moves, which make you a little bit tired. Uh, on the, these side pulls, the feet are not the best. And then there are a couple of bad crimps, tricky heel hook, and doing this move is probably the linking crux. Once you get this one, you have a couple of okay moves leading up to yet another rest on this really nice tufa. And here I was also entering the section which I hadn't tried before, so all of the route, starting from here, was flash. So after I finished my onside try, I went through the route with Danny. He told me all the beta and then I decided to go for it. So I was told that the next section is uh, still quite hard, but it's not really the crux. So I definitely wanted to get a good rest in this knee bar. And this is quite also interesting. The next clip is not really super hard, but it takes a little bit away of the power from you. This is like the super weird move, which you, when you have this weird left hand under clink, and the next hold is, is really far, especially with the lower foot that I did it. It's kind of like a move where you feel like it's really possible to miss it. But luckily, I hit it perfectly, did the next move, clipped the next bolt, and I was safe. The feeling when you climb such a long route with good knee bars is like you never really get super pumped in your forearms, but it's like overall fatigue, which is a big factor uh, depending on how you are feeling on the route. So right here I didn't really feel super pumped, but yeah, it's like this overall fatigue, which kind of means like as long as you keep having good rest, you do a couple of moves, it's fine. But as soon as you do like a couple more moves, like without any rest, where it's more like revolving in power endurance and the intensity of the moves are, is higher, then you quickly find out that you can get pumped really, really quickly. I would also like to note that the first ascent of this route was done by Ramon Julian, uh, who did it without knee pads, which definitely in this route makes a big difference. And I think, I think there is almost no doubt that this route without knee pads and without actually doing knee bars is more of a 9A+. I think with a knee pads, it's probably like a soft end of a 9A. Uh, so it's pretty impressive ascent by Ramon Julian uh, some years ago. So this section is really fun, uh, going feet first. That's like kind of the last crux of the route, which is more like 
you know it shouldn't fall, uh, but the fact that I was flashing it definitely made it a bit spicy. Here I have my feet jammed inside this hole, but it's a kind of strange situation because because of the feet inside the hole, you can't really get with your hands into the best possible position. So it's not like I was too nervous that I would fall off, but yeah, there was like one or two seconds when I was feeling that I'm getting tired and I would like to have my hand in that jack and I just couldn't get it in there. These are all the good holes and you can clip the chain. I think it was a good decision just to try the crux and get lower down. Like this, I was going through the main crux pretty, pretty solid, but then it was still kind of adventure and still definitely exciting. <laughs> Not knowing where to go and uh, even though I got a little bit of beta from Jonathan and Danny, I think it was, uh, yeah, still had to definitely climb. I didn't feel like it was over. I had to be focused until the very end. Even though the higher you go, the easier. It gets. So there was this free pitch project prepared by Hippie, but it's definitely important to note that the very first pitch of this route was bolted and climbed way back in mid 80s by Craig Smith, uh, an English climber who was there on the visit climbing all of the first pitch with just a few bolts and giving it 7C, which is a pretty low grade for this pitch of climbing. And also, I think climbing with only five or six bolts is, is really bold. So I tried my best to give it a good onside try into the second pitch. Uh, the lower part was okay, but then in the hardest part of the route, I broke a tiny side pull. So the, my onside try was over. I went up to the end of the main difficulties of the pitch. And then I went down as quickly as possible. I didn't really have much time to rest because I knew it would be getting dark quite soon so I had to set off without much rest and go again so I quickly climbed the first 15 meters up to the crux where I broke the hold in the previous try due to the fact of the broken hold uh, the crux got definitely much harder and I knew it was gonna be a fight. So the crux revolves on this very slopey left hand arrest, almost non-existent right side pull. You have to slap venga, up venga. with your left hand up the arrest. Then right hand is Absolutely nothing. It's like two finger, six millimeter hold. Ah, Slap up the arete again and a very sketchy left foot hold. And you have to go up onto this okay crimp. Just an amazing venga, venga, venga. sequence which resembled more mm. like climbing on the sandstone and not on limestone. Really cool to climb. And then you continue on this really technical phase. You're in a vertical wall, but all of the climbing feels quite powerful for being on a vertical wall. And also the pump is definitely the factor, even though you are basically climbing a vertical wall. Uh, and also as I didn't really have much time to rest, I was definitely tired here. And yeah, I definitely felt quite a bit of pressure. I really wanted to send this pitch. Uh, and I knew that there was not enough light to, to give it yet another try if I made a mistake. And he also in the previous try didn't really check the moves like super well, so sometimes I was forced to improvise a little bit. 
just like with this heel hook rest. It wasn't definitely like very comfortable, but I knew I had to get something back. So right above my head, there is uh, one more bolt that you clip and then you're facing the last crux of this pitch, which is very interesting. Uh, you traverse to the left again, to the arete, just to the left of the arete. There is a good crack, but all of this position feels kind of really weird. This right hand underclink or side pull makes you feel like you're going to go barn door and yeah, uh, I had a certain sequence in my mind that I wanted to use, but <laughs> I just <laughs> figured out that I was too pumped to to follow that way, so I had to improvise a little bit. But this heel hook definitely made a big difference. And here, I was thinking like, yeah, this this could be it. I should not fall anymore. And I knew that very soon there would be a good good rest where I would be able to stand more on my feet and the climbing will get easier. I really like when like the pitch has a certain crux and then there's always some top uh, section where Woo! you basically know you're not going to fall and you can really enjoy uh, the last meters of climbing. Buena, Adam, buena. The very last pitch is really cool climbing on amazing grey limestone. I think it's around 60. Grande, bro. <laughs> and I was also told that there is something really cool uh, waiting for me on the top. For it, Adam. Adam Salva. It was, I have to admit, I was a little bit scared. I mean, I was really looking forward to it when they told me that this would be the surprise, like, wow, what the hell. But then you're standing on the edge and you're thinking about it and it like, looks far. Uh, and now, all, with the experience of climbing, like all I was thinking about, will like the catch be like relatively hard? But then it was like super soft. It was like jumping into the trampoline and it was like super nice. I wish I could do it like many times in a row. Well, it was a definitely challenging afternoon. Three pitches, pretty various climbing. First pitch I think is about 8A. The second pitch I think it would have been an amazing 8A plus. But in the cracks, I broke the, uh, the crucial crimp and uh, at first I felt like mm, maybe it's not even possible. But then I found some really, really tiny holes, like you're having a like, really good red, but it's like a really slick limestone and this one is really bad. So I think it's like 70 ball problem by itself and then it's still quite resistant. So I think in total it's like AB plus, the last pitch is maybe 60 and then the jump itself is... I think it's impossible not to be scared when you're just standing there on the edge, you know, like everything is super safe and, but it takes some courage just to jump. But as soon as you start flying, it's, everything is perfect. A uh, hippie oh. que traído mi eh, libro de las fotos. Ojalá que 
¿No te gusta? The local climbing community in Bontanejos was just incredible. I mean, it's really difficult to find a climbing community which would be so welcoming, so hospitable. I mean, it was really cool to see how my visit was kind of steering up the psyche of them. Uh, it was definitely a few days in Montanejos that are impossible to forget about. Thanks for all the preparation, organization, and hopefully see you soon.